Okay, all set? Great. Great, Nikisa. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody for attending this evening. Uh, my name is Richard McCoy. I'm the owner of Richard McCoy Horticultural Services. Uh, we're located right near NOFA, right in Ringo's, New Jersey. Um, and most of our work is in that area. And it's my, my pleasure this evening to, to introduce Dr. Tommy to you. Um, I just have some written remarks that will be brief, um, but because I'm in a unique position to introduce somebody that I, that I admire very much. I've had, the, the, they're, they're long and probably a little long-winded, but bear with me. So not often I get a chance to do this. So in each of our life journeys, I'm sure that we can all count on one hand the people that we've met, read, or watched that have directly and dramatically impacted our lives and careers. Very rare occurrence that one has the opportunity to introduce one of those people directly. So as I mentioned, uh, it may be a bit long-winded long because this happens to be one of those opportunities for me. Conservation, horticulture, restoration, landscaping, and ecological land care are three terms that have become synonymous with the work of Dr. Douglas Talmy. Dr. Talmy's work has shaped many of our landscape and gardening philosophies, some nuanced and intricate scales, and other in grand and revolutionary ways. Dr. Talmy's groundbreaking 2007 book, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants that completely upended the way I view the land. Bringing Nature Home made me realize that there was a more productive way to landscape. This book, and nature's, this book and Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, more than any others dramatically changed the trajectory of our company's mission. Both Bringing Nature Home and this evening's lecture on Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, are the type of revolutionary work that lay the ground work for the fundamental changes in the way the current traditional landscape plant attitudes are viewed. These two works have such, has such a significant impact on the way we view the landscape that I wholeheartedly believe that it can change the landscape industry if these practices that Dr. Talmy suggests would be embraced on a grander scale. For our company, Home Gardeners, as well as other companies like ours, gone are now, now gone are the days of landscape designs with large expanses of kirk grass, non-native plantings that serve, the same, that serve the same ecological purpose as a painting of a landscape on canvas. The, in other words, traditional landscape practices add very little to no ecological value to the landscape. In many cases, traditional landscapes actually are net negative environmental impact. As Aldo Leopold, as Aldo Leopold states in the San County Almanac, his 1949 classic environmental stewardship, a land ethic, a moral code of conduct that grows out of these interconnected caring relationships. Dr. Talmy's work is a roadmap for these interconnected and caring relationships. Bringing nature home and a nature and Nature's Best Hope, Dr. Talmy quantifies and explains why plants and insect communities are crucial to how humans are interdependent on these native plant, insect, and, in its, and insect interaction, which in turn provides ecological balance, value ecosystem function, and ecosystem services of the landscape, and thus the land ethic that Leopold spoke. Furthermore, and perhaps an unattended benefit of Dr. Of Dr. Talmy's writing, he provided a, those of us in the landscape industry the tools, the language, and statistics to educate our clients on why native plants are so important. This evening's topic, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard it, uh, and is a, is a uh, title of the University of Delaware, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Talmy's 2019 book. And tonight it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Douglas Talmy. Thanks very much, uh, Rick. That's a, it's quite an introduction. I don't know if I can live up all that, but um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give it a try. You know, I'm talking to, to uh, a bunch of organic uh, growers, so you people already know an awful lot about what nature's best hope is. But um, before I, I go into a little bit more detail than, than uh, Rick did on, on my idea of what nature's best hope is, I want to talk about what happened in uh, 2019 fall of 2019, we had what we call an oak mast. All the members of the Red Oak Group, up and down the East Coast actually, got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it, and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of that acorn. First, wow. it chewed a little hole for its, its head, then it forced its head capsule through there, then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze, made it look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped in. And this is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. 
So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the surface of the soil, it takes about 30 seconds. And once it's down under the underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts, parts are way down here. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets into the egg cord. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Uh, why don't they come out the, the very next year like most insects? And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns. Of course, once the, the acorn weevil has left the acorn, it leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with uh, three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants that where the entire colony lives in the vacated holes made by acorn weevils. And if scouts find a new acorn with an acorn uh, weevil hole, they get very excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn. It takes about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here, make sure nobody else gets in there. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? My point is that is simply just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature. Interactions largely between animals and plants. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn from the tree and fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And then they tap it beneath the surface of the soil. And the object is they're gonna go, go find it in the wintertime and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they, they bury, they forget where three of them are. So they actually end up planting three acorns for every four. And they can, they can bury, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns in a season. So jays are the primary way that oaks get around. Uh, here's another specialized interaction. The, the Juanita Sphinx requires evening primrose. You won't have it without it. And that type of specialization is really common in nature. You won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants because carpenter ants are what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That's the only pollen that that particular bee species can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 40, 44,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plant genera. So for example, in our area, there are at least 13 species of native bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head, on and on and on. I could talk about specialized relationships all night long. Point is that today, these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, looked out over the, the wonderful view, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. But of course, leaving it as it is is no longer an option because we didn't. Um, it was only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have, we have logged the country repeatedly. We have, we have tilled it, of course, so we've drained it. We've grazed it, we got 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need in order to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done that? I don't know. Uh, I, I guess we thought the earth was so big that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing crazy headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's nearly a third of our North American bird population, already gone. 
Now the UN says, uh, you know, it's very likely we're going to lose a million species to extinction within the next 20 years. I love the way they re report headlines like this. Um, they might as well say that we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years. Um, it's not an option. You don't just do this and go on to the next headline. This is a disaster. We have to make sure that this does not happen. So I could go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment and thus upon all of our houses. That's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline. Insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in a, this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, where his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish, those food webs would collapse and the animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is, of course, that that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. And, and what I rarely talk about is we're going to have to change the way we farm too, which we can do. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are totally dependent on, on nature. They are products of nature. We are products of nature. Uh, we can't live without it because it's nature that delivers what we call ecosystem services. Here are a few things that we, we get from plants. We always talk about ecosystem services as if it's just for humans, but all living things require these things, like oxygen. It's plants that produce oxygen. It's plants that clean, clean our water and slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. It's plants that are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, pumping it into the ground for long-term storage. They build their tissues out of it as well, but um, soil scientists are now telling us that uh, our soils can store up to seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. We just have to get it in the soil, back where it was. It's plants that are building topsoil and holding it in place, preventing floods, dampening severe weather, converting sunlight into food. Pretty important. Without plants, we'd have to eat sunlight, and that'd be tough. What are animals doing for plants? Well, they're providing pest control services. They're pollinating nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They're dispersing plant seeds and many other things. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is, is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because we've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. Humans alone need more ecosystem services now than ever before. So taking huge areas of the planet out of production is, you know, just a bad idea. Uh, and, you know, Rick talked about Aldo Leopold. Uh, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the, the most eloquent. And one of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies, our huge Asian societies have been terrible at doing that. We historically or habitually take more from the earth than it, than it has to offer, completely ruining in an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, clearly not sustainable behavior. So Allah had a dream or a belief that, that we humans actually were capable of, of um, learning what he called uh, a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed that we could learn to do those things gently enough that we, we would not destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called a land ethic. Wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about though was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in Ella Leopold's uh, culture 
still embedded in our own culture today, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue this afternoon is that uh, not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that is left to us. Of course, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to, to turn that on its head and save nature where there are a lot of people. Actually reconstruct nature because in most of those places, we've already dismantled it. We have to do it where there are a lot of people because that is almost everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every single year, but thrive. How are we gonna do that? Where should we start? Well, let's go back to private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail because we'll be working on, on uh, parcels that are too small and too isolated from each other. This is a very different approach from the last century where we've confined conservation to parks and preserves. We do have parks and preserves, but it's obviously not working. We, we wouldn't be in the sixth great extinction if it were. So we now need to do conservation there and outside of the parks and preserves as well. Now, when I talk about conservation, um, I'm not, not using the word in the traditional sense. Yes, we wanna conserve the parts that still exist, but we actually have to rebuild nature. It's not officially restoration ecology because true restoration ecologists will say, well, you're not gonna restore exactly what was there before humans came, okay? Uh, but it doesn't mean we can't reunite enough of those specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature in order to create functioning ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was in a particular place three or 400 years ago. In order to do that though, uh, we have to start with the building blocks of ecosystems. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most important components. And there are two groups that we cannot do without. The first group would be the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those flowering plants to reproduce. Uh, these are the plants that are, are capturing most of the energy from the sun, converting it into food, storing that food in their tissues, mostly in their leaves. Uh, so now we have the, the energy from the sun stored as food in plant parts. But if you don't move that energy to, from plants to animals, you don't have any animals and then you don't have functioning ecosystems. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants and those invertebrates uh, are insects. But it turns out that um, it's not all insects are contributing to, to food webs equally. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So when we're designing our ecosystems, when we're designing landscapes that are going to thrive, they have to con contain a lot of caterpillars or you will have a failed food web. Let me use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, we have a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. They, of course, are the birds that are, are uh, feeders. I think you've got Carolina chickadees in South Jersey, but shortly thereafter, they switch over to the black cap chickadee. It's practically the same bird doing the same thing. And they are at our feeders eating seeds all winter long. But that's only 50% of their diet in the wintertime. The other 50% is insects. And when they reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will, rear, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of, of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my students did recently, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to uh, bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to their, their young at the nest. And they were gonna send those pictures to Ashley and she was gonna identify what the prey items were in the beaks of the birds for as many birds across the country as possible. And this is a summary of her results. 20 common bird families in North America. The, the green bars are the uh, percentage of the nestling diet that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of our landscapes. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce successfully. So what's special about caterpillars? It turns out a number of things are special about caterpillars. Uh, and one of them is, is pretty obvious. They are soft prey items. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage uh, with a very thin wrapper. 
The, sus the wrapper is his exoskeleton. Uh, it's, it's cuticle. It's made of, of chitin, which is undigestible. And the birds don't want a lot of undigestible material. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring them. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And many of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or eat one caterpillar? They are nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. They're, they're, uh, much of a beetle is undigestible. And beetles have a lot of sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mentioned carotenoids, uh, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. They have to get them from plants. Uh, and we vertebrates have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of our diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have a lot of carrots to get my beta carotene and a lot of tomatoes to get my lycopene and a lot of whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. Improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this prothonotary warbler male, who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. He takes those lutines and builds pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. But where are they getting their carotenoids from? From what they eat, of course, but carotenoid content is not equal across invertebrate prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars, and they have far more carotenoids than other, other types of prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. Far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. It's only the caterpillars eating green leaves. And here's the earthworm down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. That study and a number of others uh, are telling us that caterpillars are probably not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many? How many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two an, uh, enough or one or two a day enough? That's a good question. Let's go back to chickadees uh, and see if we can answer it. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. Uh, it takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get one clutch of Carolina chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. And that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of, of a bird that's a third of an ounce to the point of independence. And if you want caterpillars, if you, if you want uh, chickadees to breed in your yard, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And I would think you would want uh, chickadees to breed in your nest because in, in your yard, because in so many places, that's all that's left is our yards. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all of those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like uh, that type of, of insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that everybody's measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds and divided ter terrestrial bird species into two groups, the groups that require insects at some part of their life history and the birds that do not require insects, the doves and the finches that can actually reproduce on seeds. Well, they didn't lose any numbers in the last uh, 50 years, but the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as you take bird food away, the birds disappear, not rocket science. So if we want birds and all the other things that are eating insects that I'm not talking about, we're going to have to change the way we landscape. In the past, we've landscaped for aesthetics, as, as Rick suggested. We can still do that, but we also have to add function in there. So we need uh, pretty landscapes that are ecologically functional. How do we landscape in a way that supports those caterpillars? 
Well, it's not hard yet. You, you add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that, that support them. There is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the plants that do, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are very fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it, it beautifully. Nothing special about the monarch, but everybody knows what a monarch is. Um, you can have all the crepe myrtle and all the boxwood and all the burning bush and all the barberry and, and all the Bradford pears and all the ornamentals that we, we plant um, all the time from Asia in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. You have to have milkweeds. That is their, the only plant that they can develop on. That is called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. Plants want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded the leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a very effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well defended. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage that is out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And a single insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are really similar in how they protect themselves. And they get good at, at uh, circumventing those plant defenses. They develop specialized adaptations, specialized enzymes that allow them to store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, specialized behaviors and, and life histories that allow the insect to avoid the compounds in time and space. But it takes a long period of, of evolutionary history with those, those plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is then locked into eating that particular plant. And that's why when we, we take the milkweeds out of our yard and put in any other plant, the monarch disappears. It doesn't start to eat the other plant. It, it is unable to do that. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild food webs, which is essential if we're going to rebuild local ecosystems, we have to choose the plants that will do that. And I'm going to give you uh, a few examples of how well this works when you do choose the right plants. And I'm going to start with, with our house right in Oxford, Pennsylvania. That's what it looked like when we moved in. We moved into a, a farm that had been broken up into 10 acre lots. It was a very old farm. It had been farmed almost 300 years. The last thing they did before they sold the farm was um, mow it for hay. So uh, there was very, very little there. And of course, when we started to build the house, they stopped mowing. And what do you think came back in the 10 acres were all of the, the rootstocks of the invasive plants from Asia that they were mowing. The multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and autumn olive and porcelain berry and on and on and on. So that's my wife, Cindy, getting ready to clear the 10 acres. And yes, she has done that. Yeah, I helped a little bit, but not, not all that much. It's been Cindy that's been, been out there doing that. So uh, if you have a serious invasive plant problem, and if you don't, I'd be surprised because most people do, don't give up. You can get rid of these things. Uh, and we can talk about, about how uh, later on. Cindy did it without any herbicides at all because she's got asthma and she just won't, won't do it. A lot of work, there's no doubt about it, but she has shown that we you can do it. What was I doing? Uh, I was telling her she was doing a great job, but I also was putting plants back. Uh, and, and of course, you're not going to have a successful food web if you don't put the plants back that support the caterpillars we're talking about. So one of the first things I targeted was the Canadian outlet. That's a Canadian outlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet. That's what the adult looks like, just like uh, leaves. Well, you're not going to have Canadian outlets unless you have meadow root. And we didn't have any meadow rue. There's no meadow rue anywhere around us. The, the area was farmed to death. I'm sure there was meadow rue here hundreds of years ago, but long, long gone. So I got some seeds of meadow rue from someplace, planted them, grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I, I actually had very little faith that, that uh, Canadian Alice would be able to find my, my uh, meadow rue. So I didn't even go out and check it. About a month and a half after I planted it, I, I did walk by for another reason, and there were Canadian outlets all over it. 
it was an immediate success. I'm still surprised about that. But now we have a good population of Metaru and Canadian owlets on the property. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. Um, this, uh, it's a misnomer of this beautiful moth here. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on, on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there were some Bidens in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seed, planted them, grew very nicely. Uh, it's an annual, uh, not hard at all. Well, it took about a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my, my Bidens, uh, but it did. And now we got a good population of both of those. So uh, now we've added four species to the property. Same story with the hackberry emperor. I wanted hackberry emperors on our property because, uh, not because they're the most beautiful butterflies in the world, but because they belong here. That's part of the fauna that ought to be here. Well, we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry. Took four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they finally did. I looked at one of my, my hackberry uh, branches in June. There were nine hackberry emperor uh, caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. Now we've added six species to the property. And that's, that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod. Uh, it came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that require goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaganothus, the goldenrod gall moth, this is, a, curiously enough, this is one that has not come, the goldenrod flower moth. Not sure why it hasn't come, but I'm going to say it hasn't come yet. That's what the caterpillars look like. But this is part of the fun. This is, this is uh, anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Uh, every year I go out and I, I look for my uh, goldenrod flower moths. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great day. Plant of Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Um, I've heard that people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a really good native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a great ground cover, has good fall color, produces really nutritious berries for the birds in the fall, very high in fat. It's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. The flowers are, are small and inconspicuous, but the native bees love them. And it's the major host plant for the large sphinx moths that are the primary uh, constituents of, of uh, cardinal diets, cardinal nestling diets. Things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered Sphinx, the hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I can get double tooth prominent uh, on our property, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on uh, elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we didn't have any American elm. There were a couple of big elms at the uh, University of Delaware campus, though, and there still are. And they make seed every year. There are piles of seeds in the gutters. Uh, so I went and collected some seed, planted them. Probably the second year we were, we were on our property. Um, so they've been there 19 years, and they grew really nicely. Those trees are about 80 feet tall now, and the caterpillar came right away. Another big success. One of the evening primrose moth, because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose in Thera, so I planted that as well. The moth comes and, and uh, spends its day with its head stuffed in, in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, these are just examples of the trees that uh, the plants that we put back on our, our yard. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, it's, it's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. Uh, and I hear people say, well, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak does for your ecosystem, and you can if you follow it, you can enjoy it immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, by the way. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web based on caterpillars from all the species that they support. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the Suzuki's pro, pro Suzuki's senior moment caterpillar moth, uh, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted onida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown buccalatrix, the orange packed smoky moth, 
the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks that we put on our property. And they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the ground. Uh, and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years or decades for your oak to start to contribute. It will do that immediately. Here's what our house looks like today. Um, we do have a little lawn. We're very traditional here, but uh, we put plants back. Not all the plants. I'm still working on it, but about four years ago, I decided to try to get a picture of every species of moth that uh, has, is now making a living at our, our house. Uh, and again, I focus on moths because it's their caterpillars that are running the food webs that, that build the biodiversity at home. And I am up to 1,128 moss species that I've photographed on our 10 acres. Now we do have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 1.2 million acres. So on 100, 1, 240 thousandths of the land area, um, we have 44% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And we have them because we put the right plants back. And because so many of these species are uh, types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we saw last year. The World Wildlife Fund says that, that two thirds of the wildlife has, of planet Earth has vanished since, since 1970. I love the word vanish. We've killed it. You know, it didn't mysteriously disappear. We've killed two thirds of the wildlife on the planet. But I'm thinking not at our house. I'm sure that we have increased biodiversity at our house by at least two thirds and it didn't take that long. And we did it simply by putting the plants back. So these are terrible headlines, but don't give up. Um, we really can turn this around if we all get serious about it and get those plants back where they belong. But I know what you're thinking. A lot of people don't have 10 acres. They've got smaller parcels. Will it work on smaller pieces of land in suburbia, for example? That is a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, uh, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy, Cindy and I have. And they're in the middle of, of a typical suburb where everybody's got the big lawns. First thing they did when they moved in was to get rid of the major invasive plant, uh, which in Kirkwood, Missouri is, is Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. So they got rid of that. They planted a lot of native plants, put in a, a feature, water feature that they, uh, they call a bubbler for the birds. And then they sat back and started to record the number of birds that use their property. And they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on less land? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago because right on the other side of this wall here is one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller than uh, the average lot size in North America. It's a pretty one-tenth, but it is not connected to any type of, of natural area at all. So she's a tiny little island, but she did the same thing. She uh, got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a little, little water feature for the birds, and then she sat back and started to count uh, the birds that have used her yard. And she's up to 120 species, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house in Chicago. It's sitting right there. What about farmland? Now, I don't usually talk about this, but um, you know, we've got what, 48, 46 or 48% of the entire country is in some type of agriculture. We've got to include that in the conservation mix. Uh, so uh, certainly organic farmers are way ahead of, of the curve here, but, but all uh, forms of agriculture should consider removing the invasive plants in their property, restoring hedgerows whenever possible, and making sure those hedgerows are not comprised of these invasive species, limiting grass edges, we'll talk about that in a second, and possibly installing prairie strips, uh, that works really well on, on larger farms, uh, again, in the, the Midwest, but you know, you know what invasive plants are. These are all the ornamentals that have escaped uh, our, our yard, our, yeah, our, our gardens. This is a White Clay Creek State Park near the University of Delaware. Every bit of green you see there is an invasive plant that has escaped our, our gardens. So uh, it's a very serious uh, threat to our, 
our natural areas because these plants from typically from Asia don't support the, the insects that support our, our food webs. So removing them on, on uh, you know, all, all private homeowners removed their invasive plants, and that includes uh, agriculture, we'd be 85% uh, done uh, east of the Mississippi. So that's really important. And remember, those invasive plants are destroying the insect populations that are running our, our ecosystems. So uh, putting in uh, hedgerows is, is a great way to restore a lot of biodiversity to, to farmland. I know the big machinery demanded that we, we take it out, but particularly smaller farms have the ability to do that. You have to make sure, though, that those hedgerows are not uh, loaded with multiflora rows and all the other things that are not supporting the, the biodiversity. Is that a lot of work? Yeah, it is. Um, but once you get them established, maintaining them uh, invasive free is, is much, much easier. So who knows, it might be easier to, to you know, mow them all down and start, start again, but they're really important components of, of uh, the biodiversity in your property. Then those, you know, the new status symbol in farming, of course, is grass on the side of your soybeans or your corn. Um, Cindy and I just drove from Pennsylvania all the way out to, to Portland, Oregon, that's where I'm talking to you from today to visit grandkids. And uh, it is corn and soybeans all the way through uh, Nebraska, and then it becomes uh, cattle. But wherever you have this corn and soybeans, this is what's on the edge of the road now. It's, it's, um, it's grass. And I, I, it's, you know, it's the high status farmer doing that. But you know what it took to, to make that grass. You had to use Roundup to, to kill all the, quote, weeds which are the milkweeds and the esters and all those native plants that support our pollinators and the monarchs and all those things that are disappearing. Here's a, a uh, you know, this is what they're a drainage ditch. And of course they're spraying that, making sure nothing's living there. This is a totally dead landscape. And it could be uh, quite a, a center for biodiversity if we put those quote weeds back. Make it look like that and you will, you will be a buzz with living things. Then, uh, particularly in, in Iowa, this is where they're doing the research, these, these prairie strips where you're putting them right in the middle of, of uh, farmland, excellent ways of intercepting uh, soil that's, that's uh, being moved by big rains off the farm, um, intercepting nutrients, so it's not all getting into our waterways and causing dead zones in, in the Gulf. And of course, it's a, it's a wonderful place to restore pollinators. Uh, pollinator populations, and all the natural enemies that help keep pests in, in check. This takes a little bit of land out of production. Uh, and, and I think we ought to have a pay-per-use tax all over the, the world. But let's just talk about this country. Everybody requires the ecosystem services that our land produces. Why should growers have to, have to foot that bill for us? If we let's not call it a tax, let's call it a fee. If everybody paid $10 a year and that money went to compensate uh, farmers for, for uh, putting some of their, their land into uh, prairie strips or, or hedgerows or other productive um, little micro ecosystems. Uh, I, I think everybody should do that, whether you live in a city or not, because you're using the ecosystem services that these, this land uh, produces. It shouldn't all come, come out of the, uh, you know, the bank account of our, our growers. Okay, there's four keys to success that we need to think about uh, if we want to succeed in a big way, and we do want to succeed in a big way, not just on farms, but everywhere. Uh, and one of them is we've got to shrink the area that's in lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of lawn nationwide, and that's a 2005 statistic which I think was before much of that farmland was where the edges were converted to grass. So it's a considerably more than that at this point. That's an area bigger than the, the size of Rhode Island, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. It's dedicated to a status symbol. And, and you know we humans are not gonna give up our status symbols, but we can reduce the area that's in lawn. If we cut that area in half and put in productive plants in, in half the area that's now in lawn, the area of lawn we keep We'll, we'll still be manicured, we'll still be good citizens, we can still project the fact that we get what the cultural norm is, but uh, the other half can be in productive plants. And if we uh, replant half the area that's now in lawn, that'll give us 20 million acres to, we can put towards conservation. And if we do this at home, we can create a new national park at home that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, 
Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So we'll have the largest park in the country. What do you get if you put, a, put parts of nature right where you live? Well, you get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the natural world, either, either renew one that you had as a child or develop it for the first time. And you can do that at your own time, your own pace. You can do it avoiding crowds. I don't know if you saw the New York Times headlines a few weeks ago about the, you know, the millions of people in our national parks now. I mean, that's great, but when you go there, you're dealing with millions of people and probably not what you went to see. It's also free, there's no, uh, no admission fee, and it's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. And this is, this is I don't know how you're gonna develop a personal relationship with the natural world unless you are alone. It's, it's you and nature, nobody mediating it. This is imp particularly important for our kids. Our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Liu. So, you know, we, we want them to get out and, and see the natural world. So we're, we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus, they drive for an hour with a, with a teacher and they walk around a natural area. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus and, and they go home and that's, that's their exposure to the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they could simply walk out the door uh, in, in their yard and, and uh, experience some, some form of nature. They have that experience, the, the, the opportunity to develop that personal relationship, which I think is vital because they are the future stewards of our planet. And if they don't have a, a relationship with what they're supposed to be stewarding, they're gonna be lousy stewards. Maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. And I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest piece of nature. It's, it's a patch of lawn with a hedge and it's about 10 by 10 square feet, so not much. But there are anole lizards there. And Zoe discovered that, sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground uh, and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so that uh, the, the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard no, no smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium and you develop that relationship. You learn how to steward that, that other life form. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture not, not long ago, so who knows. But I guarantee she's gonna remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And uh, I guarantee this is gonna help her be a good steward of the planet. If you want your kids to do more than, than catch lizards, get uh, Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Um, dozens of wonderful examples of how to expose your kids to, to nature right where they live. And if you wanna join Homegrown National Park, you can go to our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org and get yourself on the map. Um, this is our attempt at, at social media. It's a call to action, particularly aimed at, at um, People who aren't already in the choir, they don't realize that their little piece of the earth is an important piece of conservation. So you put in your, your information of where you live and the amount of, of lawn you're converting to, uh, to native plants. Uh, and then your, your little uh, it's a firefly will, will light up on the map. And you get to see other people in your county who have done it. We get to see connectivity build across the country. The object is to get our 20 million acres um, converted. And if we, if we do that, we'll, we'll add another 20 after that. So far, we've got about 9,700 people on the map. But it's free, doesn't cost anything. And no, we're not using your data for, for anything. So, so get on the map. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. Um, some of the plants we put back in the area that was in lawn have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. What's a keystone plant? Well, what's a keystone? Remember the, the Roman arch? The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. And that's because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. Think of the, of the keystone plants in the ecological house you're building as the two by fours that are gonna support that house. They're essential. You can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. 
but they're not the only thing. You're not done building your house when you have your keystone plants. It's just that you can't leave them out. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are, but there are a lot of native plants that, that don't support very much as, as well. So the question really is, do we want the most productive species that support our pollinators and our cat caterpillars in our landscapes uh, or not? I get uh, an, an email once in a while from, from somebody who says, don't you know that ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, grew in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgo grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today or not, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not, the, that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're productive or not. And I don't care whether ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago or not. They produce zero species of caterpillars here today. Uh, so they're there, they're occupying space, but they're not contributing to your local ecosystem. And they're typical of an awful lot of non-native plants. What's producing more than any other plant genus? It's, it's Quercus, it's the oaks. In the middle Atlantic states, they support 557 species of, of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. Here's the power of keystone oaks in, in my yard. Oh, I see, I did not update this. Well, so far I've recorded, it's actually uh, 1,128 moth species in, in our yard. Uh, and out of the 1,128, 981 have known host plants. So there's a lot we don't know what they're eating. Out of the 981, 287 species use oaks. And we've got 69 genera of native woody plants in our property. And only one of them is, is the oaks, is Quercus. And we've got hundreds of genera of, of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our our total plant diversity, but they're supporting 29% of our moss species diversity. That's the power of a keystone plant. If we took them out, our, our species diversity would be far less than it is today. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on uh, the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the ranked list of both the woody and herbaceous plant genera that are best at supporting the caterpillars in your local food web will pop up for your uh, for your county. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and I say, I, I want to buy a cherry, for example, they're going to, they won't blink an eye. They'll just sell me a, an a Asian ornamental cherry. If I want to buy a willow, they'll sell me a weeping willow. Those are the plants that are in the trade. You have to specify that you want a native member of these, these genera. Same thing with birch, maples. You don't want a Japanese maple. You want a native maple. Because if you don't get a native member of these, these genera, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the major herbaceous uh, plant genera. Uh, not only are they best at supporting caterpillars, so for example, uh, goldenrod support 110 species of caterpillars, but um, they're also best at supporting the uh, specialist plant, uh, specialist bees that can only reproduce on particular plants. So between solidago, the genera the asters were broken up into, and perennial sunflowers, you get about 44 species of native bees that you would not have in your yard unless you had those particular plant genera. Really important. And remember, the, the generalist bees will use those plants as well. So if you want to support your native bees, plant for the specialists. And you're not in Canada. OK. Um, all right, we're going to uh, reduce the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. And then we're going to kill them, kill all the insects that come to our yard with the, the uh, light pollution that we have at night. And that, of course, is not the goal. Light pollution is turning out, the research is suggesting it's one of the major causes of insect declines, uh, at least in the temperate zone in the world. And these are all the, the ways that, that night lights kill insects. Um, to me, this is actually good news. We have got to turn around insect declines. That's not something we can tolerate. We've already lost 45% of all the insects on planet Earth. Not good. And if we can do that, if we can start to turn this around simply by flicking a switch, by turning off the lights we have on at night, we're getting off easy. That's a really easy thing to do. But I know what you're going to say. You can't turn that light off over your garage because uh, the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. 
Uh, and if you don't want to do that, take the, the white bulb out of your, your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is, is uh, best because yellow wavelengths are the least attractive to, to uh, particularly those night flying moths. If we were to switch out our white security light, light bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save billions of insects and probably billions of dollars too because um, LEDs are a lot more are energy efficient. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights. Then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill all of our insects. Uh, this is a booming business around the country. You all, you all know this. Um, everybody's fogging or spraying for mosquitoes. Uh, well, Mosquito Joe says that it's okay because this is a natural product, and he's right. It is a, a pyrethroid-based uh, product. Uh, which comes from chrysanthemums. It is natural, but you know, cyanide is natural too. So that's not a good argument. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes and that's not even close to true. I don't know if you followed the headlines last fall during the monarch migration. Monarchs that flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds dead on the ground. Um, it kills all the insects you come in, in contact with. The big deal is that mosquito fogging doesn't work. It's expensive and it doesn't work. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Well, mosquito fogging kills between 10 and 50% of them. So it's not even close to being effective, which is why he has to keep coming back and back and back. And you have to keep paying and paying and paying for something that only kills other insects. If you really want to control insects uh, in, in your yard, try it, mosquito dunk. Get a bucket. People say, how big a bucket? It doesn't matter. The bigger, the better. Fill it full of water. Put in a handful of, of straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days. What you're doing is building up diatoms and algae, and that is what mosquito larvae eat. And that becomes an irresistible brew uh, for female mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. They're attracted there. They will lay their eggs in your bucket. You put in a mosquito dunk that you got at the hardware store, nine bucks for, for a whole tray. Uh, and the mosquito larvae hatch and they chew on your, your dunk. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a, a bacterium designed to kill only aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is, is a mosquito larvae. So it's very targeted. If a, a dragonfly gets in here, it doesn't hurt it. If your dog licks it or a bird drinks, it doesn't hurt it a, a bit. So it's cheap, it's targeted. And if everybody did it, we'd really put a, a, the crimp on those mosquito populations. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their, their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth caterpillar, complete the development on the tree. So the caterpillar eats the leaf, uh, it, it spins a cocoon and then hangs, hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. And it's not just from oaks. About 94% of the, the caterpillar species that develop on trees drop from the tree when they finish growing and wiggle their way beneath the ground, form a, a uh, pupa underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact our soils underneath our, our trees to the point where uh, it's too hard for the caterpillars to get underground. So the way we landscape nearly everywhere becomes an ecological trap. The moths fly in, lay their eggs here, the caterpillars grow and then drop down and die. And the next generation is smaller. And the generation after that is gone. I'm convinced this is a major, another major cause of insect declines wherever we humans are. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. Now, this is what most people do. You have a big tree in a yard, and we're just starting to measure uh, how caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee you they do better in a situation like this where you have a tree, then you have a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, ferns, ground cover. It's a safe site. Nobody's going to step on it. Nobody's going to mow it. They can easily get underground or, or pupate. This is where you can do your, your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, put plants around your trees. They become safe sites for those caterpillars. This is where you can use your, your uh, native ground covers, things like wild ginger, or may apples, or foam flower, or ferns. Here's a, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maples. Any caterpillar developing on these trees can drop down into a safe site, even though it's the middle of a city. So we can do a lot better if we think about what those caterpillars need in order to complete their development. 
And uh, research from another grad student, Desiree uh, Narango, has, has uh, suggested that there really is room for compromise in our plant choices. And compromise is a good thing. What she did was look at in the, the suburbs of Washington, DC, she looked at how landscapes that are dominated by native plants sustain chickadee populations compared to landscapes dominated by introduced ornamentals. And the first thing she found is when those landscapes are dominated by introduced ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. They're 60% less likely to have, have breeding chickadees at all. So even though their nest box is up, the chickadees come look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna, not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to mature. If you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in, in your yard. And we looked at woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage from none to 100%. This is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything above this line, you've got a growing population. And if you make fewer babies below the line, you've got a shrinking population, unsustainable. Right here is where those lines overlap. Uh, so it suggests very generously that you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native. Can't be, we can't tolerate invasives because those are biological tumors. They just keep spreading. But you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your box with the things that aren't going to spread, even your ginkgo, as long as they don't dominate the landscape, as long as you've got 70% of your woody plant biomass native and still have a sustainable uh, a breeding population of, of chickadees and presumably other birds as well. So this is the area of compromise that I'm excited about. If my message was you can't have a single non-native plant, um, very few people would be, would be listening. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Absolutely, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a, a well-developed cost-sharing plan at this point. It's called the Lawn to Legume Plan, encouraging homeowners to take out some or all of their lawn and replacing it with uh, um, appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular. Pennsylvania's got a new lawn conversion program as well. It's only two years old, but you can get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your lawn into native plantings. There's an island off Florida that's paying residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls a listed species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to take care of it. Everybody would want one. Missouri and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a, a bounty on calorie pears. You take out your calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And even, even uh, public utilities are getting into the act. In, in the West where there's not enough water. San Antonio is giving people $100 coupons to use water efficient native plants. And of course the big lawn conversion programs in California up to $2 per square foot rebate for taking out the, the lawn that, that they do not have the water for and putting in xeric plantings. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one's a serious one. We've come to think that nature is optional. In other words, it's not essential. We like it, but if, it, if it's not there, it's okay. And that of course means that if it's, if it's optional, when push comes to shove, and there's always a shortage of, of resources, nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the, the uh, virus broke out and there's this wall-sized poster there which epitomizes, in, in my view, our society's view of, of conservation. We're going to save wildlife for future generations, for future generations to enjoy. This was, this was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the, the national park system. We need to save these wonderful places so that future generations can enjoy and appreciate them. And, and, and I get that. But that suggests nature's there just for entertainment. It is there for entertainment. But it's much more important than that. We need to save. Uh, nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. 
We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but by restricting conservation just to the areas where we don't have a lot of humans, we've, we've condemned those efforts to failure because those areas are too few, too small, too isolated. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our farms. So we need to put the plants back. We need to glue our rug back together again, not just to make biological carters that, that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we humans live, work, play, farm. In other words, for the first time in modern history, we're going to start coexisting with nature. Our third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because every single person on the planet requires a healthy ecosystem, depends on a healthy ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the, the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching this one, teaching our kids, teaching our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. So right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink their lawn, one person can get rid of their invasives, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can, can um, use keystone plants, one person can totally revitalize the ecosystem and the little piece of, of the planet that they have, have power over. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's, that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that, that you can manipulate. If you own property, that's obvious, that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park or preserve, help a land conservancy. They're all underfunded, understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate in the future and then ultimately our own. I think I've convinced uh, my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. You're welcome. That was fantastic. I feel like I have to go out and there and rip out the multi-floor rose that's taking over the fence. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> But not tonight, not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> My husband's looking at me like I have seven heads. <laughs> and I think that mosquito dunk is going to change my world. <laughs> oh, good, good. I hope so. <laughs> All right. Um, does anybody have any quick questions for Doug before we uh, part ways and start ripping out our invasive species? I hope you don't mind if I'm speaking instead of typing this. Um, I've actually spent the last two, two summers, uh, 20, uh, 2020, 2019, pulling out a lot of my ornamentals and replacing them with native plants. But I think if you, look, you, you consider the majority of the population between DC and Boston, a lot of them are like, I am, and my property is 100 feet by 100 feet. Uh, presents a, a number of considerations that would not be, um, could not be addressed by what you could plant on a 10 acre piece of property. And I, th I think a lot of our message has to be directed toward smaller property owners and, and, and reminding property owners that landscapers that call themselves landscapers really only know how to mow lawns and whack weeds. 
<laughs> there has to be another source of education for suburban homeowners. Thank you. Well, that's, that's why I throw Pam Carlson in there with her 10th of an acre. Um, she is a landscape designer. She knows what she's doing, uh, but it's beautiful. It's a small area and it's effective. The, the, main, the main message here is that that tenth of an acre is attached to another one, which is attached to another one. The, you know, the plants and animals around us don't look at property lines. So if, if we get enough people doing this, it can be a lot more effective. There's no doubt that the bigger, the better. Anybody else? Well, Doug, thank you very, very much for taking the time tonight. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. It. You're welcome. All right. All right. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Okay. You too. All right. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. All right. Take Thanks. care. All right. Bye-bye.